Hello, everybody. It's Phil Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Uh, today's uh, talk is mismatch theory. It is uh, September 7th, 2021. If you'd like to subscribe to Civil War Chat, please click, the click on the subscribe button here in the lower right and also the notification bell in the upper right. So here it is, uh, September 7th, 2021. I think it is tomorrow in which they're going to take down the Lee statue on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. And that will be the last Confederate statue standing on, um, oh, it'll be removed from Monument Avenue, so there won't be any more. And that's kind of one of the things I want to talk about indirectly here is that um, how the uh, uh, emphasis on uh, race is affecting the uh, interpretation of Civil War monuments. So uh, let me get started uh, just by pulling up my notes and I'll get started on mismatch theory. Despite confessions over their regrets about slavery and segregation, the history of Southerners is being rewritten to demonize their parents, grandparents, and ancestors. The educational programs and materials of the 2017 National Reconstruction Era Historical Park, for example, are almost entirely dedicated to the Black experience. Even though there were twice as many whites as Blacks in the South during that period, the history of the former is largely ignored at that uh, national uh, park. To the extent that whites are mentioned, they are generally portrayed as forever scheming to do nothing more but abuse Blacks. Most historians apparently interpret that, that interpretation. The others have gone AWOL chiefly because, I assume, they fear being accused of racism. Since the full story of Southern history cannot be told while that corrupting myth prevails, today's episode and perhaps others in the weeks ahead uh, will examine systemic racism. According to Shelby Steele, a black fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, American whites made their great confession regarding slavery and segregation in the 1960s. Since any confession causes the confessor to lose moral authority if she does not make amends, Congress passed two powerful acts in 1964 and 1965 concerning civil and voting rights. Unfortunately, they were followed by government and institutional mandates providing special privileges to Blacks that impeded their own self-reliance, the self-reliance of the Blacks, thereby tending to make them dependent upon white benevolence. Today, today's episode studies affirmative actions and other similar concessions. Since the 1960s, Blacks have realized that white guilt is the source of their power. Steele estimates they've obtained as much as $22 trillion in racial preference funding since Lyndon Johnson became president. Aside from politician and activists and program administrators, however, few Blacks truly benefited from those programs. Government housing forced Black fathers out of the home. Affirmative action left many Blacks and women with, quote, imposter syndrome, close quote, a condition of doubting their own academic, academic accomplishments gained by way of the lower standards vouchsafed by white males and Asians through affirmative action. Unfortunately, Continued funding for the program provides colleges and institutions powerful systemic incentives to perpetuate the myth of minority victimology. Mismatch theory is one of them, and it postulates that affirmative action perpetuates in inequality because it puts the recipients in situations where they are likely to fail. A 2012 study at Duke University suggests that admitting minority students to schools where they are less prepared than their peers to is counterproductive. 
Duke admitted black students with average SAT scores one standard deviation lower than whites and Asians. Three fourths of the black males that enrolled intended to major in the hard sciences or economics. And that was a higher percentage even than white freshmen. However, more than one out of two black males later switched their majors, whereas only one out of 12 white males did so. Had the minority students had similar levels of academic preparation, they would more likely have continued with their original course of study as the record of historically black colleges and graduating science majors suggests. In the diversity delusion, the Manhattan Institute's Heather McDonald writes, quote, science students with credentials more than one standard deviation below their peers are, are only half as likely to graduate with science degrees as students with similar qualifications attending schools where their academic preparation matches that of their peers. Getting rid of, of racial preference would reduce blacks, uh, Duke's black population by half, but the half that remained would be fully competitive with their peers. Unfortunately, most affirmative action scholarship recipients enroll at the best schools they can, which reveals two additional factors. First, the Duke black males that change majors to the humanities most likely did so because they found the sciences to be too difficult. Duke's black freshmen with humanities majors, for example, got higher grades than the students of all races in the hard sciences. The science majors themselves, black and white, reported their science coursework to be more demanding and spent 50% more time per class studying them as compared to the time they spent on humanities classes. A second consequence that affirmative action presages is the formation of academically dubious departments such as black studies and gender studies. In the mid 1960s, Yale offered just one African American history course. By 2016, it had 49 African American history classes and 45 in African studies. After 1996, California voters passed Proposition 209 to ban race preferences at schools. The University of California created artificial ways to circumvent the ban. UCLA, UCLA Law School, for example, formed a specialization in critical race studies. The predominantly black applicants get a boost in the admissions process. Outside of critical race studies, however, Cal's black law school students cluster in the bottom 10th of their class, a performance gap that cannot be explained by racism since nearly all exams are graded blind. In facing reality, Charles Murray cites a poll showing that the average American estimates that blacks compose 30% of our population, whereas the true fraction is only 13%. Given such a difference, it seems unlikely that black grievances are failing to get a sympathetic hearing, even when they include dubious claims like systemic racism. After 55 years of affirmative action, however, it is progressively evident that more of the same will not change the black white performance gap. Only more personal responsibility on the part of blacks will do so but most black leaders deny it. As Jean Dattel puts it in Reckoning with Race, quote, the underlying causes of black denial are the denigration of the middle-class values, the tendency to fall back on past injustices and the disproportionate emphasis on black identity for political purposes. Okay, what I'd like to do now is to, uh, share my screen and show you this. Um, this is my book, Causes of the Civil War, and it tells you 
not only why the South seceded and why the South fought, but also why the North chose to fight. And this is one of the points that is commonly overlooked by most academic historians. The North um, wanted high tariffs for their industries, manufacturing industries. Now, most academic historians will tell you that you know, the war wasn't over tariffs because the tariffs prior to the war were at the lowest point they had been for decades. And um, that misses the point because it was not the South that seceded over tariffs. It was the North that chose to fight over tariffs because they did not want a new country on their Southern border with low tariffs. And they did not want to lose the uh, domestic monopoly that they had in those states for their manufactured goods. And the tariffs, so the tariffs before the Civil War on dutiable items averaged 19%. But for the next 50 years, they averaged 45%. So the evidence is really pretty clear. They more than doubled the rate of tariffs once they got control of Congress. And that was a Northern war motivation, not a Southern war motivation. So tariffs were a Northern motivation. It was not because they wanted to collect tariff revenue per se. What they really wanted was domestic monopolies through the protective tariff scheme. For example, in 1866, the year after the Civil War, railroad iron in the United States cost $85 a ton, but it was available for $32 a ton in Liverpool. So if you'd like to get a copy of the causes of the Civil War, you can get it at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and other fine bookstores for $22. If you'd like an autograph copy, just contact me, Phil, P-H-I-L, underscore Lee, L-E-I-G-H at me, M-E dot com. Okay, uh, that's our show for today and thanks for watching.